I'm launching this podcast to replace my lectures for undergraduate and graduate students, but just possibly to appeal to a broader audience of curious, intelligent non-specialists. We'll see, I guess. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 1, The What and the How. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. And you, dear listener, are hearing this either because you want to learn to read like an English professor, or maybe because I've assigned this episode to you. Or both. As this is my inaugural episode, let's start with a word about the coverage and format of this podcast series, uh, and then a few more words about who I am and why I'm doing it. The two subjects of this series are the what and the how of reading literature. The what is what's between the covers, what happens in the text, its meaning as I see it, its most interesting ideas, to me anyway. You notice how tentative I'm being. That's deliberate. My interpretations of texts aren't definitive because nobody's are. Some are more valid or better argued than others, using more compelling or comprehensive evidence. But don't listen to this podcast for quick summaries or definitive interpretations. Anybody who promises you that shouldn't be trusted. Listen to this podcast instead more for the how of reading literature. Think of the what in this series as a set of case studies. They're full of interesting difficulties and unique features. That's why I chose them. But their particularities are less important than what each one teaches us about reading methods. How do literary critics read differently from everyone else? How do we interpret literature? The question a critic confronts when approaching a text is, how should I read this? What have I learned from reading other texts that it resembles? The length of these episodes will vary because the time necessary to cover certain books or subjects always varies. It depends on obvious things like the length or the complexity of a text, but also on more unpredictable things like how frequently I digress from the main topic. My students are listening for material that will prompt their journal entries on the book, so occasionally I will suggestively highlight a provocative idea or question. I foresee this podcast dividing into seasons or terms that follow my teaching terms, fall, winter, and sometimes spring. Since the global pandemic shifted our teaching online, university professors like me have had to adapt quickly. Most of us, me included, shifted online in the midst of a regular teaching term, so it was a matter of picking up where we left off. Not only did we deliver knowledge, teach skills, and assess understanding entirely through our screens, we also struggled to retain the best features of face-to-face teaching like the rapport and trust that you build in a community of learners. Circumstances dictate that we teach online by default now and in the future. Currently, that's the default at my institution, which takes public health advisories seriously. So here we are with the imaginary headspace of this podcast replacing the real space of a classroom. I'm launching this podcast to replace my lectures for undergraduate and graduate students, but just possibly to appeal to a broader audience of curious, intelligent non-specialists. We'll see, I guess. It depends on how interesting I can make my subjects, namely the books themselves and the methods of literary criticism. As they say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So this series is going to cover literary texts. What does that category mean? 
Well, in the words of Humpty Dumpty from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, quote, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Most open book episodes will be about fiction, poetry, and drama, because those are what I teach most often. But some will be on more general subjects, like how to annotate while you read, or why reading long, difficult books is still worth doing in the age of Wikipedia. As for particular books, this first season will cover the four major texts I'm teaching this term. And all these publication de details are in the show notes. The first is Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, part one, published 1605, and part two, published 1615. We're reading selections from the 2003 Edith Grossman translation. The second book is Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, published 1803. We're using the 2013 David M. Shapard edition. The third book is David Truer's The Translation of Dr. Appel's, published 2006. And finally, the fourth book is John Milton's Paradise Lost, published 1667, and we are using the 2005 Norton edition of Gordon Teske. The more recent 2020 edition appeared too late for this series. If that selection sounds a little random, well, that's university teaching for you. It's like repertory theater. You teach all kinds of different texts in rotation. And again, they're case studies, far more important than the particularities of their contents or the methods that good literary critics use to analyze those contents. In addition to the four long books by Cervantes, Austin, Truer, and Milton, this series will cover a number of shorter poems and prose readings. For those of you making a shopping list, the poems are from Colin Burroughs' 2006 Penguin Anthology titled Metaphysical Poetry. Episodes on various sections of these four long books are going to overlap with each other. So if you listen to this series episodes in the order they're published, expect a bit of jumping around. For instance, Milton's epic poem is more than 10,000 lines long, so I'll cover it in multiple episodes. Each episode in this series stands alone, although there are some that play well with others, so to speak. Some, like my series on Milton's Paradise Lost, are best heard as a series from start to finish. But each is also designed for someone who hasn't read the text. Unless you're one of my students, of course, and then you have. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, each episode starts with a summary of the text, just in case, where we are, uh, what's to come, and then it plunges in and takes you on an interpretive journey, my interpretive reading, punctuated by plenty of direct readings from the text itself. Often, those will require byways and digressions into historical and biographical contexts, and it will include comparisons between texts, looking for generic features, and so on. You can also expect, though, that the methods I use to analyze one text will translate over into reading another, and yet another. That's what literary criticism is, a set of methods and practices that you can apply to any text whatsoever. 17th century epics, 19th century poetry, or 21st century novels, political speeches, or terms of service. Okay, so you're unlikely to analyze terms of service with the same care and attention you give to poetry, but you are going to use the same critical reading skills of reading between the lines, looking beyond the surface of things. The more literature you read, the better habits you develop of reading everything. Criticism becomes automatic. A brief digression on that word, criticism. People tend to use it pejoratively, that is, negatively. Everyone's a critic. Stop being so critical. Even in the 18th century, Alexander Pope told Homer's readers, cavil you may, but never criticize. To cavil is to notice petty or insignificant things. Contrarily, to criticize is to notice important things. That's why doctors talk about critical stages of an illness or critical steps in a procedure. They're influential and decisive. Sure, critical also often means fault-finding, identifying weaknesses. 
When a film critic or a restaurant critic writes a devastating review, it can be difficult to find constructive suggestions in their descriptions of everything that was wrong. But critical reviews are cautionary tales for the next filmmaker or chef, and that's where criticism is useful. When it's done well, it identifies the key weaknesses, and when it's done fairly, it praises strengths. Digression over. So, for those of you still listening, who is Michael Elliott, and why is he doing this podcast? Well, like I said at the top, I'm an English professor at the University of Calgary, and I've taught undergraduate and graduate English literature students for 20 years, mostly about William Shakespeare and his contemporaries, but my teaching has extended all the way from Beowulf, the 8th century Old English poem, to Virginia Woolf, the 20th century novelist. I've taught the most august, dead, white European males, Chaucer, Shakespeare, Wordsworth, and company, but also BIPOC essayists like Gia Tolentino, Zadie Smith, and ta Coates, and also recent American poets like Terence Hayes and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. But what's far more consequential than the what, as I've said already, is the how of reading. Simply put, I teach students how to read, not basic literacy. That skill is a pretty firm prerequisite of university programs. But expert-level literacy, the way professional literary critics read, namely for ideas in their multivariate complexity expressed in beautiful words, more or less. It takes years of practice, but it can be taught. I also teach students how to write. Again, this is writing that surpasses the basic skills of stringing sentences together into paragraphs, and paragraphs into essays. This is writing that uses compelling evidence to make persuasive, precise, and elegant arguments. Again, writing effective literary criticism also takes years of practice, but it can be taught. Second digression. I've used the word essay, which sounds a bit like homework, and sure, often it is. But when you briefly consider the word's roots, you learn that the essay is more an exploratory attempt at interpretation. In French, the essay literally means a try, a free-ranging, provisional, thinking-aloud sort of interpretation. Its original masters were the Renaissance writers Michel de Montaigne and Francis Bacon. They wrote collections of essays in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, Essays with titles like Of Imagination, Of Cannibals, and Of Anger. My favorite title of Bacon's has to be Of Seeming Wise, because professors like me aspire to that every day. And even today, there's something provisional, a word that means temporary, like a working theory, about the essays that even expert critics write. Their advances on the standard issue five-paragraph in this essay I will discuss model, and yet they have the same ambition to try an interpretive reading in the hope that it convinces you. Digression over. Think of the episodes in this series as a set of exploratory essays of varying lengths, gathering evidence from sources on some central topic. The topics will vary, but each episode of Open Book will, I hope, do just what it says on the tin. Open a book to your mind. That's why I gave the podcast that name, after rejecting pretty vague titles like Thinking Aloud, nice wordplay, but it didn't really work, or bland titles like Approaching Literature or On Reading. An open book is transparent about its techniques, even or especially when they're complex. An open book is an invitation to read, to move past initial difficulties, to work for the rewards of understanding. And an open book is a path to possible worlds, to experiences quite unlike your own, and to novel thoughts that seem natural and obvious only after you think them. But enough of all this. On with the show. I hope you come on the journey. 
You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on Plato's dialogue, Phaedrus, and the invention of written language. And then, the first episode of a multi-part series on John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash U-L-L-Y-O-T. On the social networks, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, U-L-L-Y-O-T at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L g-a-r-y dot c-a The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka.